Let me just begin uh, by centering, uh, a centering prayer that I often offer uh, for myself uh, as I gather my thoughts. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My task uh, in this address, uh, as it is every year, it seems to be to give you a sense of uh, where we are as a diocese, um, uh, to uh, uh, speak to you about this present moment in the history of our ministry, and then to talk a little bit about the work that you are doing and then the work that we're doing together. I want to conclude uh, with a few words about our future, the year ahead specifically, but also a look at the next five years. The Episcopal Diocese of Texas has been in existence since 1838, with some Episcopal church members having arrived in Texas before that time. We've been at work together as an Episcopal ministry for over 183 years. We have faced a pandemic and epidemics before, multiple times before, cholera, yellow fever, smallpox, dengue fever, measles, influenza, diphtheria, and whooping cough. All of these were accompanied with protocols and even quarantines. The Spanish flu was so serious in the Diocese of Texas and within our congregations that some, like St. James, who lost over 75% of its congregation, fear they would have to close. But in fact, they did not. We have also faced bitter weather before and electric outages and clean water shortages dating back to 1899, 1930, 1949, and 1989. And we have experienced a wrath of hurricanes. Uh, perhaps I am the statement of the obvious man on this one, but uh, a wrath of hurricanes across our coast. And over these many years, the largest ones uh, taking upwards of 200 lives and damages of over $100,000 uh, leading up to Harvey which was close to $3 billion. These largest storms in our time of ministry together number 11, not including all the smaller ones. And then winter storm Uri comes, promising to cost people in uh, Texas over $3 billion worth of damage. Rarely have we in our history had to deal with all of these in the same five years. Uh, or for those of you who were traumatized by Laura in the same year. We are a church, a community experiencing in this season trauma upon trauma as we enter the 12th month of a pandemic life with a good bit yet to go. If James Stockdale were remembered at all by the general public, it would be for his disastrous vice presidential debate and ensuing Saturday Night Live characterization. However, there is much more to Stockdale's story. James Collins reported in his book, From Good to Great, a conversation that he had with Stockdale regarding his coping strategy during his period in a Vietnamese POW camp, which lasted for over seven years. Stockdale said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, he added, I would not trade. He was asked about the difference between his strategy and the strategy of others, and he said, that's easy. It was the optimists. They were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. Christmas would come, Christmas would go. And then they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter and Easter would come and Easter would go and then Thanksgiving and then it would be Christmas again, he said, and they died of a broken heart. This is a very important lesson he offers. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end which you can never afford to lose, 
with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Collins would call this the Stockdale paradox. Admiral James Jim Stockdale returned to the US, taught philosophy at Stanford University, a brilliant, sensitive, and courageous man, according to many of his students and his peers. As Christians, we know the reality of suffering, for we are a cruciform people in cruciform communities who understand the way of the cross, the suffering of Jesus, and the brutal reality of the world in which we live. We know it is faith in Christ and not ourselves, so that when we triumph, it is Christ who triumphs through us. And we might well even say that we have our own understanding of the Stockdale paradox, though uh, it is clear theological roots. So here we might take up the theology of the cross, which is given particular meaning as we hear Jesus' suffering words from the Psalms of Lament. Many of you know this particular psalm, which I offer here, 130. It's one of my favorites uh, in this time. It's part of our prayers for the ill and infirmed in the 79 prayer book. Military chaplains use it. Hospital chaplains use it. The laments are psalms that unite the people of God in one voice. They are to be sung when one forgets, when one needs to remind oneself of God's faithfulness and God's continued presence with us. It is the kind of psalm that tells the blunt truth about our situation that does not masquerade the pain, hide behind false optimism, or turn a blind eye to the suffering of others, and at the same time reminds us that we are not alone. The psalmist gives words to our pain. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. I've been saying that this crisis and pandemic will take 18 to 24 months before the end of the long suffering. And that though it didn't look like much at first, we had and still have the potential of losing over 1 million people to COVID. And in the 12 months now behind us, there is a lot to lament. I have visited with clergy and parishioners over these last months about laments and what we are lamenting. Some of you have even been writing about these laments and have sent me graciously uh, examples of your thoughts and prayers as you journal and consider your lamentations. There is indeed sadness here. There is sadness for the effects of the pandemic, sadness for our distance from one another, sadness to not see friends and relatives as we would like, sadness from isolation, economic trials and job losses, a sadness not to, to be together in church, a sadness not to be at the altar all together. Clergy and bishops and people share this longing of celebration. Clergy and bishops share a longing for preaching to fill churches again and to be with all of our people. We may buoy ourselves up with low church jokes and the need to learn a new old forms of prayers like the daily office, and we have not shied away from such challenges, but alas, this is no practicum about what church may have looked like before 1979. We cannot pretend that we aren't lamenting a very real loss of embodied Eucharistic life and a life and community together, ministering together. And part of the trauma is that the pandemic has brought again to the surface our shortcomings as well our shortcomings within our community, with our wider cities and our country, with each other. Yes, over liturgy, but over common and shared life. The psalmist cries, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. There has been, over this time, awareness of the death of Black people at the hands of police 
and the needs for police reform. There is a coming and deepening awareness of the pain of people of color and how they feel in this country. People of color, color have been lamenting for years and white people cannot turn a deafened ear as Christians. There has been our political division, our state of affairs, a difficult election, post-election season culminating in the assault upon Congress. And we ask ourselves, how did our signs of deliverance like the cross come to stand next to a gallows and Nazi flags? And Christianity becomes so aligned with symbols of white supremacy. We cannot avoid such questions of how the demonic stalks our ultimate concern, as Episcopal theologian Dr. Kate Sonderegger suggests. And as vaccines are rolling out, we have the winter storm URI with temperatures that have resulted in a new disaster of proportion affecting congregations invading our homes with freezing temperatures and water, literally family members freezing to death within our church family and without. Parents concerned that they might lose their newborn children in the cold night and the lonely and depressed left in greater darkness. Many parishioners, many clergy, and some 20 congregation have broken pipes across Texas. Many millions plummeted into darkness without water for days on end, some as much as seven. And the governing of our electrical grid has caused death and suffering across Texas. We have suffered a new trauma, though we are not done with the others. I feel like sometimes I need to step outside my door and yell, I am mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, as Howard Beale in the movie Network cried. And then there are the other days where I feel a lot more like Jack Nicholson in the movie As Good As It Gets, who wants to barely crack the door open and say, go sell crazy somewhere else. We're all full up here. So the psalmist gives words to our lips. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. The psalm of lament is more than simply a sadness. It's about helping the one who prays or sings the psalm to remember that God knows our pain and suffering and cares for us and for the lowly and offers hope a hope that pandemics and powers and loneliness and all the struggles of this world will not have the last word, that pandemics and politics and suffering, even the 500,000 plus deaths will not have the last word. Instead, God will have the last word brought about Christ and his cross. The shared suffering is real. Shared pain is real. Community felt loneliness and lamentation is real. But like death, it is all conquered by Christ and his cross. We must deal with the blunt truth of our situation, the pain and the suffering. We cannot hide from it. The lamentation psalms remind us there is hope in God through Christ Jesus. Hear, O people. Hear, O people, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem us from all our iniquities. Hope in the Lord, this hope that we find Christ, the incarnation, his ministry among us, his crucifixion, and his sending us out in the power of the Holy Spirit to minister in his name is a work of making hope real in the world around us. Even in our lament, when we have needed to be reminded of Christ's presence in our lives, in our congregations, amidst our family and friends, we have been about the business of making hope. Blood drives and food drives and clothing drives and mass drives, uh, drive through prayers and pet blessings. You have been about the work prophesied in Matthew 25. You have fed and clothed those in need. You have given people life. You have done so 
as you would have done for Christ. Because of our work at St. Vincent's House in Galveston and our combined efforts at St. Luke CHI and Texas Southern University and St. Luke the Evangelist in Houston, we have literally helped thousands and thousands of people over the last few weeks in our poorest neighborhoods and communities to receive vaccines. That's something the Diocese of Texas has done in making hope. Even as you have cared for each other, as you have buried the dead and visited the sick, taught, prayed, and found new ways to worship, you have been about God's business of hope making by being Christ's hands and feet in the world. We continued uh, through the first part of the pandemic to do our relief around Harvey recovery from rebuilding homes to uh, counseling uh, survivors and food distribution. The next slide, you'll see in the midst of everything going on, how the church here, uh, uh, how much there is to lament. You have made hope in your cruciform communities and lives, uh, given witness in the video we just saw, but even more so as places like St. Christopher's Austin gave away $55,000 in reserves to six entities to serve their community how Kilgore has helped to keep the Boys and Girls Club afloat, uh, how North Shore Episcopal Church has hosted the drive through baby shower for 80 expectant mothers, and St. Mark's Austin forgave over $500,000 in medical debt, or San Pedro, it's weekly giving uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, St. Timothy's Lake Jackson, led by Genevieve regime, took the lead and partnered to undertake a food drive for the region with Holy Comforter Angleton and St. Paul's Freeport. St. Julian of Norwich and Round Rock and Soco worked diligently to help families keep from getting evicted. St. Luke's on the Lake rushed to the aid of hurricane-destroyed areas in Louisiana over the last year, while the small church network in St. Paul's Navasota held a blood drive. St. James Houston honored George Floyd by giving away, collecting and giving away food to its neighbors and those in need. This is the work of the baptized. This is the work uh, of a lay-led, clergy-supported church, uh, a work of, of true hope making. El Buen Samaritano giving over $1.5 million in aid away and weeks and weeks of food. Others joining in food safety efforts. Uh, St. Isidore distributing over 1.25 million pounds of food to those in need. And then came the winter storm just last week, having already given so much. You, the people of the Diocese of Texas, you rolled up your sleeves again. You came together to clean up churches from the damage done by the storm in each other's houses. The neighbors began water ministries for drinking. And my favorite one was the right to flush ministry. As people collected water for people's homes. Warming shelters opened up across the diocese from one end to another. Seminarians and clergy baptized people, cooked in their own kitchens and got in their cars and drove around and fed the homeless. The spouses group went into immediate action and began to pray for one another as the people reported in and how they were doing. And thanks to Texans Brene Brown and her folks, we crashed the Episcopal Relief and Development site by raising up so much money to give across Texas in need of the storm. You are a remarkable community of people who make up the Diocese of Texas. This is part of what's so beautiful about our ministry. Yes, there are buildings and structures and organizational infrastructures and diocesan councils, yet we are everywhere and always a group of baptized people serving Jesus across these 57 counties. It is a sight as your bishop to behold and a tale well worth listening to. When I lament, when I lament, when darkness closes around me, your bishop, when I doubt, when the dark night of the soul comes and the black dog, and I have one nips at my heels, and it does, all I have to do is remember you, all the good 
and the hope that you make every day. So let me turn now to our common and shared efforts across the diocese. Let me turn to the good work that we've done. First, I want to hit some highlights, how Episcopal Health Foundation has partnered with you to make a difference in our neighborhoods across our counties. This next slide shows you that 1.5 plus million dollars moved into congregations and into communities in order to serve and reach out locally. We've had engagement with, with uh, churches across the diocese in every one of our focus areas, which have proved to be solid interest for our congregation. The areas have remained consistent given the pandemic, and if anything, they have been more relevant during the pandemic, as so many have already witnessed today. During this time of physical distance, we've continued to offer online educational resources in our mission and community organizing work. We're mobilizing congregations interested in civic engagement and advocacy, particularly around the health, health policies. Moreover, we together through Episcopal Health Foundation have given an additional $13 million to COVID response to clinics and ministries across our 57 counties. We might wonder when we look back if transitioning the hospital was a good idea, but this slide shows you that we've been able to give away over $372 million into community health efforts since that time. We are granting over $35 million a year to health mission in the diocese of Texas. A person in our feedback in our 360 review asked, we need to do more for the poor. Quite frankly, we are engaging at a very high level the work of mission and ministry through service for examples of our congregations and our wider church efforts through ministry of Episcopal Health Foundation, St. Vincent's and El Buene. I offer you as a witness to how the Diocese of Texas through its shared ministry and mission is indeed making a difference and creating hope in our communities, especially for the least whom Jesus loves. We turn now to the good work that we are doing in mission and church plants. Despite COVID today, we've continued to plant and have 19 new communities being birthed to celebrate clergy and people gathering and working together to support and help neighborhoods to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to help people discover a life lived within a cruciform rule where belonging and believing meet sharing and serving. You might remember that I shared with you a number of years ago, I think it was about 2014, a bold vision for where we would be at this time. And what you will see is that we are well on our way to reaching our goal in 2025. We continue with our 90 plus missional communities two of which have now become congregations of their own. We continue to learn and break down barriers, gathering for word, prayer, fellowship, and service, leaning into the baptized, forming these new communities. We continue to grow our campus missions. I'm so grateful for the witness on the video. Some 21 campus missions uh, undertaking the work across the diocese. One of them uh, one of the, the uh, campus missioners, uh, as the storm hit, uh, took a couple of friends and they went and they opened up uh, the student center uh, and they gathered in hundreds of students without water or electricity and they fed those students and warmed them and let them charge their phones. Anybody with a, a young adult in their house know how important that is. And when asked, well, how did they know to come? They said, the word got out. Something was happening at the Episcopal Student Center. Here's our overall college campus mission footprint. It is amazing, but we have a large, uh, a large uh, goal there of 80 campus missions. And we need you as congregations to look outside your doors and see where these community colleges and universities are and to help us partner with us. We're waiting for your phone calls to help us to grow our campus mission footprint. 
Certainly, there have been technological innovations, uh, stresses and strains, even this morning as we try and do counsel. But we have literally shifted on the dime to, to, to move our congregations to worshiping online, stewardship online. We shifted our seminary in the Iona School online, so much so that the students now call it Zoominary. Almost all of our congregations went online, something that we've been talking about for ages. And now uh, uh, we were able to, to come together to sponsor tech grants for congregations either to put in new tech or to upgrade their tech. We saw online growth and engagement, not just through worship, but what we began to realize is we could gather for Bible studies and book groups and prayer groups. And there was a cross-pollination. How long have we said, I wish the people at 8 o'clock knew the people at 9 or 11? And all of a sudden, they were in Bible studies together and attending classes together. And we were actually brought together in new ways. We're even trying to learn as Mission Application conducts its COVID-19 survey, figure out how we have managed to do this work, but also what's ahead of us. How do we continue this mission and ministry online even after we gather? Let me turn now for a moment uh, to, uh, to our financial uh, responses as a diocese uh, with over 700 people involved in that process of financial uh, guidance in this diocese, uh, united mission orientation for all of our boards and finance committee. What you see is that we immediately were able to push $5 million in grants to congregations and institutions in our phase one COVID assistance, financial support to congregations in crisis, support in terms of uh, assessment grants, support of institutions, El Buen Samaritano, St. Vincent's House, assistance to Camp Allen, who lost over 75% of its business, grants for rent and food and utility assistance, grants for the assistance of clergy and families. And because we knew that this would be a long, long road ahead to recovery, we already have a COVID-2 response ready with assessment assistance to continue in 2021, additional support for curates, congregations, and missions in crisis, continued support for health measures for clergy, families, and support of all of our institutions. As you probably remember from my report many times, every year the Diocese of Texas puts more money back into our parishes than uh, are given to support the diocesan ministry, over $8 million a year in grants uh, and health grants uh, for insurance and support for mission and ministry and service leaves the Diocese of Texas. And if we rolled in the additional EHF, it would even be higher. This year, uh, we have doubled down on that. And in 21, we gave out an additional $5 million, as you see, and are prepared to continue that work, both as we recover from pan the pandemic and URI. But that is not all that we've done, and you'll hear from Linda in a little bit more detail. Of course, hopefully you've been attentive to those presentations about our diocesan budget, but we turned our diocesan budget and said we have to look here too. We have implemented an assessment leveling plan, lowering for new and smaller congregations, resetting our assessment for long-term smoothing as we come out of our pandemic so that congregations aren't thrown into new crises uh, over the next three years. As the COVID crisis continues uh, and disasters loom, we continue to place these dollars in service of you and your ministry so that we may collaborate not only with the hours of people's intention uh, and work, but also through dollars. We are prepared for 21 and to respond to URI. In the midst of all this, we continued our racial justice initiative through our, uh, uh, our work, our missional approach uh, to racial justice, uh, we are giving out our first scholarships and programs and grants this year, beginning to put that $13 million to work to repair and mend our future. We're doing this through the Thomas Kane Fund and uh, Talbot Fund and Sadler Means Endowment. Uh, the Pauli Murray Fund and David Taylor Endowment and Henrietta Wells Scholarship. Much of this is online for you to read more about, but it is to say that we have people deeply involved uh, from the historic Black churches in leading this initiative. And it's very exciting to see the first recipients of scholarships 
and grants being named. We must understand that, that this is more than just uh, the, the, that part of the process, but rather that the Episcopal Health Foundation understands the importance of having conversations around racial justice and the support of health equity and the goals of increasing inclusion and exchange among diverse groups. Our team there is offering expert-led support and convenings of congregations across the diocese, support to develop congregational and community-wide initiatives. We've worked with over 84 congregations over the last year. As you also heard phase one uh, of uh, dismantling racism and some of the numbers from Denise Trevino on the other side of the street at the diocesan office and Mission Amp, uh, over 2,000 unique visits to our material and over 500 individuals from over 81 congregations participating in the conversation about healing the racial divide. We have not stopped our efforts to raise up leaders for the future of the church. You might remember some years ago, we were talking about our need for new clergy and how we only had ability to send five a year. We had our first ever conference with all theological students present over the three-year period. There were over 45 students attending. It was something quite amazing and overwhelming to take in then in a short amount of time, we have reversed the decline in clergy leadership, a dramatic, dramatic increase. These efforts, along with our recruitment strategies, reveals that in my episcopate, we have moved from a time when we saw only 18% of clergy who are women serving the church in this diocese to 44% and that we've moved in less than 1% of our clergy of color to over 13%. Our goal, of course, is to have leaders and lay and ordain that match the diversity of our mission context, and so we have much more work to do. Of course, all of these stories, even more than we have time for today, are available on our diocesan website and may be found in the Texas Episcopalian, a true celebration of the ministry of the baptized in the Diocese of Texas. We share this news. The Diocese of Texas office, your, your staff at the office share this news, and we want you to go and to share it with your people, to let them know and inspire and encourage, to give courage for new mission and ministry. You are amazing and doing incredible work, and each of us is responsible for celebrating one another's successes in the name of Christ. I did want to talk a little bit about the 360 review. We did a deep dive on the health of the diocese and on my leadership. We did very well. Uh, we uh, surveyed across the diocese leaders, and su uh, they suggested that we were uh, 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 doing well and believe that the diocese really understands itself as undertaking the mission of God uh, in Christ Jesus and a form of reconciliation, a mission that is lived out in evangelism and service, the presentation of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in such ways that other persons may be led to believe in him as Savior and follow him as Lord, even in the fellowship of the church. As John Stott said, the great commandment to love our neighbors meant that, that we were to be concerned about their welfare. These two went together, he believed. He's famous for saying that evangelism and social responsibility are like two blades of a pair of scissors working together to cut through the darkness of the world. We got good scores in terms of being a learning diocese, high marks as a diocesan family, one that fosters a learning culture for leaders. We also received high marks uh, as a diocese that is transforming lives of Texans globally as a cruciform community, 87% of responders. You can go to the Diocese of Texas website or connect through the Diocese of Texas Vimeo page to see a much longer and more detailed presentation of our 360 review. And there is a uh, uh, email so that you can share feedback. All of that goes and is shared with uh, the uh, executive board. We must look at our 2025 goals. 
These goals come out of our conversations with you, with our board members, with our executive board, with our diocesan staff, reflecting uh, what we have before. The traumatic effects of the pandemic and even longer to assist our people with post-traumatic experiences lived uh, during this time. We have a lot to do. There will be in the continuing years adaptation and implementation around technology, new pastoral care needs, new forms of service, and sharing the gospel. We have much to do. And by the time we reach the middle of 2022, we'll be able to assess better the work before us over the next five years. Nevertheless, we will make it through this season of life in Texas, and we will continue to do the work that has been given to us. And therefore, we have made smarter goals, specific, meaningful, achievable, relevant, time-bound, evaluative, and readjusting goals. 40%, we hope, of our congregations by 2025 uh, will be growing. 290 communities is our goal. We hope to have an average Sunday attendance of over 26,000 people. We hope to measure the average weekly attendance, and we hope to continue membership growth to 75,000 people. 300 first-time visitors will be measured each week in our churches. We hope to fund more than 300 million to impact the wider world. By 2025, the diocese, its worship, institutional mission, schools, and camp will touch the lives of over 220,000 people each year. We will implement a communications plan, which is already underway, and continue to see the further diversification of clergy leadership and resource congregations. I want to tell you that I am going on a sabbatical. Uh, I'll be leaving uh, in agreement with the standing committee and the staff beginning June 1st. Uh, I plan to rest, to fish, no surprising there, spend time with the girls, opportunity to be out in nature. I'll be writing some and thinking about our ministry together uh, as we complete 13 years together. Be a focus on art as well and hope to come back rejuvenated as we take on the rest of 2021. We must face with brutal honesty the facts of our particular circumstances. We are in the midst of a particularly trying period, a period that has yet to fully reveal its effects. We have further to go. For the impacts of the pandemic, our cultural and political health, the poverty and suffering of people, the sheer loss of life, and the PTSD of these events will leave a pastoral crisis in our country and in our world that will far outlast the pandemic itself. Let me be honest with you, we have had hard times, and there are hard times ahead, but we will continue. Because God is not finished with the Episcopal Church, and God is not finished with the Diocese of Texas. God is not finished with you or with me. As a leader, I have to tell you that this has been some of the hardest, most difficult, and painful time in my life and in my ministry. I have, like many of you, suffered mentally from the burden, and physically as well, as you have, both priests, deacons, and my people. I share this because there is no shame for a Christian in being honest about suffering. Part of the truth that we must dare to speak is our own suffering and pain, our own lament. We will not get through this without the brutal honesty that our Christian faith affords us. Now, I know what you're doing. You're getting all worried. I have good doctors. I have a spiritual director and therapist and psychiatrist, and I continue to maintain a very strong rule of life. 
I have peers of my own who listen to me, pray with me, cry with me, deep friendships and family ties that care for me. So I am okay. I am well. But I also have suffered. But I know Christ loves me, that Christ shepherds me, that Christ takes me by the hand and takes me by the heart. Yet leadership remains difficult. So I want to offer you five pieces of godly counsel as your bishop. I rarely do this, but I am today. One, find people, a support system and a rule of life within which you can be honest about the pain and stress that you are dealing with in this time of trial. Two, recognize that we all have limits to our capacity, so we will all have moments of breaking down. They're actually to be expected and common to us all. So remember to forgive yourself. Rest as best you can. And when you are ready, step into the world again. And forgive others. Three, we all also have deeper layers of resilience that we have ever known before. Reach deep then within yourself. And find the faith that is in you that will carry you through, as has been the experience of so many of our faith ancestors before now, even in worse circumstances. Remember the hope that is in you, as Paul says, and see the work of God's hands that are around you in the world, incarnational signs of hope, people making hope. Four, know that when you are alone, you are not alone. You have first and foremost God in Christ Jesus. Moreover, you have been provided with comrades and colleagues and the rest of us who are all there with you. And whenever you can, reach out to one another and be open to them whenever you can in return. And lastly, remember, we are not, you are not, ever, forsaken. You have been made anew through the death of Christ. You are meant for belonging, love, and for care. Many of you know the blessings that I offer on any given Sunday. It's that piece adapted from Phillips Brooks, a great 19th century Episcopal preacher from Trinity, Boston. It is a prayer for me spiritually and a spiritual practice to say that blessing, to remember that we are not praying for easy lives, but pray that God will make us stronger people for the living of life, that we aren't to pray for ministry, work, or mission that is equal to our gifts and talents, but we are to pray for gifts and talents to meet the ministry and mission and work that is before us. In this way, whenever we pray in this manner and work, our mission is finished, it will not be the work that is the miracle. It will be you and I that are the miracle. You will be the miracle, people of the Diocese of Texas. And every day we shall see together the power and the grace and the mercy and love that has come from God through us into the world. You see, the baptized of Christ, I, I believe this. It's part of what gives me faith and hope, especially in the tough and traumatic times in which I find myself, in which we find ourselves. The work that you have accomplished over this last year, the work that we have accomplished together, that we have done together has transformed the world and had a huge impact. It is not just amazing, but you are miraculous. You are the miracles. And I wonder every day, I wonder at the grace and mercy and power and love that flows through you and comes from God into the world around us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.